Good afternoon and welcome to this Melbourne conversation at the Melbourne Indigenous Arts Festival. It's called Black Literature Stories About Writing Black Australia. Good afternoon and welcome back. This event's been developed as part of the 2014 Melbourne Indigenous Arts Festival. My name is Daniel Browning. In my day job, I'm a producer and presenter at ABC Radio National. Uh, before we get underway, I need to again acknowledge that we are meeting on the lands of the Kulin and I pay my respects to their elders past and present. I'd like now to introduce our panel of writers to discuss this whole idea of black literature and stories about writing black Australia and all of the panel members are award winning. Dr Tony Birch teaches creative writing at the University of Melbourne. He's a distinguished writer of books. Distinguished writer, of course he's a writer of books. He's a distinguished writer and his books include shadow boxing, and uh, Father's Day and Blood, and Blood, of course, was shortlisted for the Miles Franklin in 2012. Please welcome Tony Birch. <laughs> Next to Tony is Ellen Van Nierven. She's an emerging writer from Brisbane whose first book, Heat and Light, is coming out later this year. And it's important to know that in manuscript form, Heat and Light won the David Uniapen Award for Unpublished Indigenous Writers at the Queensland Literary Awards. Please welcome Ellen Van Nieven. <laughs> uh, next to Ellen, Adrian Highland is a Ned Kelly award-winning writer of crime fiction and he's the author of Diamond Dove and Gunshot Road, both of which I think, both of which are set in the outback. Can you please welcome Adrian Highland? And Dr. Jared Thomas on the end, he's a writer based in Adelaide. His first novel, Sweet Guy, was published in 2005, shortlisted for the Victorian Premier's Literary Awards the year after. And his forthcoming novel is Calypso Summer. It's to be published by Magabala Books, the indigenous publishing house based in Broome, and it's due out later this year. Can you please welcome Dr. Jared Thomas? So I guess there's a lot of questions to be asked this afternoon, but I was certainly saying to um, some, some members of the panel before, it's, it's great to have more questions than answers. We don't expect to really be able to answer some, such big questions in a, such a small space of time. But we want to ask questions about uh, how Aboriginal writers go about depicting, de depicting rather, uh, other Aboriginal people, Indigenous Australians in their work. Uh, and what are the ethics around depicting the black voice, transliterating, interpreting the black voice? And how do non-Indigenous writers benefit from actively connecting with Indigenous people and communities as part of their research? And my big question is how do we foster a strong or stronger literary culture in our Indigenous communities? Now, Tony, can I begin with you? Um, this whole question of non-Indigenous writers creating or writing black characters and of interpreting the Aboriginal voice, wh where do you stand on that? I mean, it's a very long cultural debate? Well, it's very long because um, the first time it was put to me was probably about 1992 and it was when I was the first tutoring job I had at Melbourne University and there was a, a course called Aboriginal Writing taught by a non-Aboriginal academic and a mix of texts that were written by Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal writers and I, in a sense the mostly overwhelmingly non-Aboriginal students in the tutorials went through incredible sort of periods of anxiety and you know, sort of like they were going to vomit um, thinking about how they might deal with this issue and, and how they would even raise the issue. Um, my, and I heard someone by the way be, before talking about appropriate um, protocols with community and putting that not to one side but putting that in the frame in a sense. I probably have a different view than, than some people and certainly than some Aboriginal people. For me, it's a sort of a mood point um, because for me, historically, non-Aboriginal people have always written about Aboriginal people and they always will. And often in a, a negative way, often in a narrow way and often in an ill-informed way. Now, occasionally that's not the case mm. and I think when it happens it's great, but the notion of, in a way, that sort of debate while you want to defend your own turf and defend your own community, for me, it's a waste of energy. For me, the more important thing is, is this, and there's another question. That is, there is a vital project that we need to engage in, that is to make sure that we, we facilitate, both through education, through um, literary avenues, to have as many 
young Indigenous people coming through to tell our own stories, um, great projects and great young writers that, that are coming through, because this, for me, is the point. What I want to see is such a volume of writing by Aboriginal people that interrogates the white voice that then you get, I think, a more informed debate and sometimes, again, a very healthy debate. The other question to raise, is, which is probably sometimes a little curly, is that if you're writing about Aboriginal characters from an Aboriginal perspective, does it mean that you automatically will do it well? No. And it doesn't. So then you're thinking about issues such as the quality of the writing and, and what you would adhere to. So I know of some texts written by Aboriginal writers which I think have represented us quite poorly and have in fact broken those protocols which we uphold. So there's no sort of cut and dried approach to this. What I see, and I was talking to a young fella up here who's doing creative writing at Melbourne University before the session started, that's all I'm interested in. And I think for non-Aboriginal writers who want to write and do write about Aboriginal characters, when they make a statement about why they do it, again, I don't, my main point with them is what could you do to help in, in getting young Aboriginal people writing? What can we do? And also the notion of, and I'll finish here, the notion of responsibility in defending. There's nothing worse than I've seen historically being an academic where you go to events and a non-Aboriginal person who's writing about Aboriginal people is, is criti criticised in a legitimate way and they automatically oh yeah, sort of almost like fail to defend their own project. Mm. Yeah, maybe I shouldn't have done it, etc. I'd rather see someone defend what they did in a very feisty way. Mm. Um, but it's about, for me, it's about genuine equity mm. and we don't have that. We don't have that in the education system. We certainly don't have that in universities. And until that happens, um, there will be a, a really Im a dramatic imbalance about what people are exposed to. So I imagine a lot of the non-Aboriginal people in this audience, they just want to read, they, they, they want to read a lot of stuff and more stuff by blackfellas, and that's what we need to facilitate. Um, Adrian, the heroine of your novels, um, a young Aboriginal woman, uh, Emily Tempest, quite a fascinating young character that she is. But we were talking yesterday about um, the ethics of, 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 of writing, of writing black, so to speak. Um, why did you create Emily Tempest? Hmm. Uh, why? That's a very com complicated answer, that actually. Um, basically, I should begin by saying I lived in those in Central Australia for many years, all over Central Australia. And to me, it was, you know, a, a university more informative than the universe I've been to before that. And I wanted to try and give, give, give some sort of voice to that world because I felt it, for various reasons, it hadn't been really touched by, by that many writers. Mm. And so I felt like creating, particularly I wrote these novels as crime novels, I was trying to, I suppose, give a picture of that wider world to that world to a wider audience. Mm. Um, you, d you did something very interesting though, and um, I guess not to, not to offend uh, some of those communities that you, 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 you lived and worked in in the Tanami Desert, you created a language group, didn't you? you know, I sort of created a whole An amalgam, geographic, a yes. graf a geographical world, yeah, which I was fairly vague about where it was. I, I mean, I suppose the people I felt that I knew when I was living there, I mean, I was thinking, I was thinking after we talked last night, one time I was, I'd been living in that place for about 10 years in different communities, and I, in, when I'd left my job and I was re just about ready to, to come back to Victoria, there were these three old ladies who'd been um, asking me for a while to take them out to their place in the Tanami, and for one reason or another I hadn't been able to get there. So that's, this is my last couple of days. I'll just, I just took them back out bush, and we had a, a lovely you know, few days just quietly driving around. And they were telling me stories and singing songs and all, and all those sort of things. And, and on my very last night there, before we, went, we came back in, I was, I, I was sort of writing down some of the stories and the things that they were telling me. And one of the last things that woman said to me was, you, and she was mentioned, you've got enough light, you've got enough light to write, up, write there, Drupala? You got to put it in the book right where white fella got to know about where. And I always felt there was that sort of those people just felt that you know so much of the of the tragedy that had, that had been sort of hit by the steamroller of Western civilization. So that story hadn't been told. 
And I, hit a, I just hit upon the idea of doing it as a crime genre because it seems a fairly, for various reasons, crime seems a fairly appropriate sort of genre for that world because what's happening is a kind of crime to my, to my way of thinking. Ellen, you're one of this new generation of, of, of young writers and editors. Um, and, and your characters in the writing I've read of yours, uh, they seem to hold true with that, that dictum that you should write about what you know. And these seem like very familiar characters. They're strong, young, vulnerable, the Aboriginal women. These are, these have, they have a very strong kind of immediate um, feeling to me. You write about what you know. Yes, I, I think, thank you for, for saying it has such a lovely uh, a description of that. Um, I think when I write, I always, I, I'm, I'm careful. I think I mean, what Tony said, that, that um, just because you might be a black writer doesn't mean that, that you're going to write your black characters well. You still need to do the work. And also, you, I also think about that when I write my white characters as well. Um, for me, I, it comes down to, to two things, and one is a truth, and, and truth might be a funny word to use for, for fiction writing, but I think it's, it's to do with the, the, the heart of the character. Uh, do you, are these characters uh, are true to life as, as you see them in their, in their fictional world? Are they, uh, do they have enough depth and dimension to hold up? Mm. Um, and also um, integ integrity, uh, because you know you're going to have to stand beside the book at one point. Um, my book comes out later this year, but um, I've had moments where truth and integrity have, have been questioned, and and sometimes um, there's been moments where I've um, I've been approached by my publisher or by a, a magazine or a journal. Uh, that, that have said, you know, we, we like your writing. Let's see some some more of the same. And I've I've gone home and I've and I've written a, a story or or a, or a part to the book. And mm. uh, a couple of weeks later, I've looked at it and thought, you know, I can't. I'm not going to publish this. Uh, there's there's something has fallen uh, fallen between that process. Um, that, I'm, that these characters don't feel like the message has been wrapped up in the story and these characters are not holding on their own. And, and uh, it's something that, that my non-Indigenous editor uh, might, might say, hey, this is, this is, I really like this, this is a great story and wouldn't understand my reluctance with it. Um, because, yeah, I'm, I, I think that that I, I want to, I want to, you know, I want to be, I want to feel an ownership of my work and feel that uh, it's not going to do any damage. Mm. That's interesting, um, Jared. Your your novel, your uh, your novel Calypso Summer is due out uh, later this year, and your other writing. It seems to me you've always had a your characters have a, a strong sense of being Aboriginal, of that being a part of the story, well, a big part of the story. Probably if I just contextualise who I am a bit. So um, I'm a person of Nukuna and Nadri um, heritage. I'm a Nukuna person. I grew up in Port Augusta on Nukuna country. Um, with Nukuna country in 1802, Matthew Flinders come into South Australia. 1840s, Edward John Eyre. By 1886, my great-grandmother, uh, there was a movement of Nukuna people into other reserves across the state, including Point Pierce. And um, in 1886, my great-grandmother with other Nukuna returned to Baruta, which is in our heartland, and refused to move. And we're then, um, it was unprecedented, unprecedented, the government returned um, 38 acres of land, I think it was. And um, the condition of that was that we, that men had to work and children had to get Western employment. Sorry, men had to work, kids had to get a Western education. So there was a diaspora of Nukuna people Sometimes we were living on our country, but not right in the heartland. Um, today, we, we possess over 4,500 hectares of country, so roughly the size of Adelaide City. Um, and we're se severely affected, um, or bound to be affected by climate change. 
So in the last couple of weeks, we had fires ripping through our country. Um, conservative government studies show that we're, we're most likely to be affected by um, sea level rise. So with my writing, um, I, I mostly represent Nukuna characters. And it's about things that are happening in our, in our world. Um, and I'm trying to communicate to my younger cousins primarily. Um, and it's ways to address those issues of the future that we need to contend with. Um, so, there is some difference in opinion between myself and older generations of my family who aren't thinking about things like climate change and those effects and are happy to continue to run, run sheep. So when I'm writing and I'm negotiating protocol, I think it's like, I'm going to negotiate protocol, but I've still got to say what I think and what is going to be benefit to younger generations. Um, a couple of years ago, I was asked to give um, preservation evidence for our the Nukuna native title case. And we kicked off the proceedings. I had to present that evidence for three and a half days, and then my great auntie who passed away last year and her ex-husband were next on the chopping block. And it was very um, adversarial from the get-go. There was like 14 lawyers in this room, a QC. Um, and as soon as I was introduced as a novelist and had to talk about the difference between fact and fiction, and they started writing down the name of my thesis, my, my publications, my articles. I knew that night that there would, there would be 10 lawyers going away, splitting up and reading everything that I'd written mm. um, to see if what I was saying, um, in terms of what my elders had taught me, was represented in those texts. So Larissa Brent says a really interesting thing about Kunadu. Um, in, in terms of its sexualization of Aboriginal, uh, Aboriginal women. And then she says, what if a judge had read that work and then was um, you know, uh, responding to a, a, a rape case of an Aboriginal woman? So it's a great responsibility that needs to be taken when we're writing about our own communities mm -hmm. and Aboriginal people. Kuna Du, that's the... Oh, Dorothy Hewitt. Um, uh, Ka 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 Catherine Susanna Catherine, Pritchard. Catherine Pritchard, yeah. And you know, by this Catherine Susanna Pritchard, um, is renowned and there's, you know, there's non-Indigenous writers that do it so well and I certainly don't um, have issues about people like Paul Kelly when they're working with Aboriginal uh, collaborating and singing about Aboriginal issues. A friend of mine, Malcolm McKinnon, uh, who's a filmmaker who's here over the years, came into our community and we were very, you know, because Aboriginal people and Nukuna, we've been vilified, we've been mystified, there's been all this exploitation over generations. Of course, we were pretty kind of edgy, but over the years, he, he established an amazing rapport and he brought a skill set to our community mm -hmm. um, to help us to, to gather and present our stories to a broader community. Mm -hmm. Um, Wesley Enoch was in the audience, the theatre maker, just before, and I, I read something that he said about what, what, what makes black theatre black. Uh, and his, in his opinion, it was in terms of the benefit to the community. Um, and that, sounds, that seems to resonate with what you're saying. If, not that not the, the work by a right, white writer becomes black, but that it, it, it has fulfilled, it has some benefit to those communities. Because we always hear, um, everyone says we're the most studied um, people on earth. I don't, I don't know if it's actually literally true, but it seems to be. Tony, you could talk about, you know, in terms of, I guess the issues that, you know, this whole conversation should be constellating around are, you know, issues of representation and authenticity. Mm. Um, you know, if you, if you scan Australian literary history, I mean, the images that leap out at you of mm. Aboriginal people are fairly negative. Mm. I mean, I think there's, there are some contradictory images too. Yeah, but I've always, I mean, there are two... I mean, just I'll get on to Jared's point about responsibility because mm. I think it's the key. Yes. I mean, I, I taught history for many years at Melbourne University and I sort of come from a history background, yeah, as in training, um, academic training. And there are two categories of Aboriginal that whitefellas historically feel most comfortable with. And that is the black fella in the gutter, who people can pity. And not so much the one they can say, I oh, look at that, no hoper, it's I oh, look at this poor mm -hmm. man or woman, what can I do for you? And the friendly Aborigine who, who will hug you. 
now. I know Brewery Pry is a big hugger and I love his <laughs> hugs. He's a strategic hugger. But I remember I saw Noel Pearson talk once at Melbourne University and, and you yeah, know, this is not a criticism, it was like a, this big bear, but a warm, cuddly bear and you could see all the white fellas at this sellout event just sitting in his feet and, Noel, will you, will you hug us? Um, and they're, I think, the dominant historical types. Why I say that and about what you do with that is that, for me, the, 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 you can get sucked in then to making sure, you, oh, okay, I'm going to write my Aboriginal character. I don't want to write a black fellow on the gutter. I don't want to write a, a hugger. Now, the problem with that is, it's, and I think Alan hit this on the head, you could write a piece and then you sit at home and think about it and think, okay, this strategically or ethically might be right, but no, this is not authentic to my character. Now, the two things that are relevant, and you mentioned the, a project I'm involved in called Ghost River. Mm. I published a short story version of that in The Guardian, I think, a couple of months ago, and I've done the front half of a novel, which is about 35,000 words. Essentially, it's about a group of what other people would call no-hopers, Alkies, these fellows who live on the Yarra River behind all the broken-down factories in the early 70s. They, yeah, they drink mefo occasionally, they sing and dance, they argue over... Whether, and if anyone's ever heard of the mighty Apollo, he was a strong man in Melbourne um, way back. Whether he pulled a tram up Collins Street by his teeth or whether he actually ate the tram piece by piece, which one of them claims. Now, they're, they're the most down and out members of society. They're banished. But these two boys love these men. They love the stories they tell. They love being with them. They love the adventure. And one of them, one of the old guys, um, Tex, he's a blackfellow who knows the true history of the Yarra. Now, for me, I love writing in these characters. To me, they're honest, they're authentic, I'll be responsible to them. And I know some people are going to read the, the book and think, geez, these blokes are no hopers. But for me, I don't want to be concerned about whether they'll be acceptable to a wider audience, except that I hope an audience who reads that will be intelligent enough to understand the full extent of those characters. I do, though, this might sound hypocritical, but I think we all censor or make decisions about what we'll write. And again, I think Jared's point is, is so important about if you're a writer of fiction and you, you put a novel out there, someone picks it up, it does have an impact on them. And if you've got an over-representation of negativity about Indigenous people, it is going to reinforce that negativity. So it is a huge responsibility. Now, I have a debate with a very good friend of mine, Mamad Adani, who's a, a playwright who's lived in Melbourne for 30 years, who comes from Iran. And he says to me, I think you're a pretty brave writer, but you're not brave enough. I said, why? He said, because you haven't written an Iranian serial killer. And it's a, it's a joke, but the point is that I make a proactive decision, and this is where I, I'll end it. If you look at the status of asylum seekers and refugees and how they're demonised in the press, how they're demonised by the Australian government, how they're demonised in a lot of media, and I know there's a lot of goodwill and a lot of people working with those communities. If I were to write a character from these current refugee communities, but I don't, because I don't feel really that equipped, I'm not going to write a, a, a serial killer. I'm not going to write a negative character because I think this community's getting enough bad press I'm not going to add to it. Now, that might be censorship, it might be an ethical decision, it can be a creative decision, but for me, at every point, whether I'm writing an Aboriginal character, I've written an, in fiction about domestic violence, which can be, are you patronising the women you're writing about? Are you, in a sense, reinforcing mm -hmm. the voyeuristic nature of you know, domestic violence? I think about those things all the time, and then when I've finished and when I've published, I need to stand up and defend those pieces of writing if someone you know, like this wants to make a critique. Mm -hmm. So you can't back away from it. But I think we make those decisions all the time, and I think sometimes people may think that fiction writers, again, as Jared said, yeah, it's only fiction. Um, like, I, I imagine thinking about what Alan talked about. You go through those anxieties all the time. You know it's going to be out there. You know it's going to be read. And with these old men, I hope people understand the full extent of their characters. They're wonderful men, I love them. But I know that some people, it, for them, will only reinforce that negativity, but I'm willing to take that chance. Mm -hmm. Tony, like, did you, those, old, those men you described, were they based on a world that you knew? Oh, absolutely. I come from mm. a long line of no hopers. Um, mm. <laughs> there's some people in the audience who know a great um, Torres Strait Islander woman, Eleanor Harding, and she told me this great mm. story once. And when I was 
writing this, I remembered this conversation. I actually interviewed her for my PhD. Mm. And this is really interesting because Eleanor Harding comes from Darnley Island. She comes from Darnley Island to Fitzroy in the 1950s. Mm. And she says, when she comes to Greta Street, it was like going to the Wild West. It was high noon, you know, it was on for young and old. And she said, yeah, there's a lot of drunks and old fellas around the streets, yeah, curry fellas, non curry fellas. And she said they used to go down the river and drink, so that's where I saw them as a teenager. But she told me this story. She said when she walked past, um, a fellow might say, hey, go on there, love, have you got some money for a pie? Yeah, I'm hungry, can I have a pie? And she said, I give him the money, and she said, I know straight away they go in the bottle shop for a drink. And I said, if they're going for a drink, why did you give them the money if they weren't really going for a pie? She said, well, that's what they do, and if I don't help them out, someone else, something else is going to happen. It's not my place to judge. So she would give them the money. Now, to me, that's very moral in a relative sense. To outsiders, it makes no sense. So we used to see these men, and yeah, people who live in Fitzroy now, they, they should know that they've displaced more homeless people than the um, Housing Commission ever did with their slum clearance. A lot of men lived in those rooming houses. A lot of those men lived marginal existences on the street. And I was fascinated by their stories because they'd always come from some other place. They hadn't been born on the street and they got there from some other place. So they always had great stories to tell. And I found them more interesting and in the sense more loving than a lot of other people. So I, I was very excited to write about them. But I didn't, I didn't, and again it goes, I didn't want to artificially redeem them. Yeah, they, they don't get off the grill. Yeah, the book that I've got coming out in April, The Promise, I've got a story called The Ghost of Hank Williams. And one of the guys, mm -hmm. two black fellows who sit under a tree near Vic Market and get on the piss together, one of them says, I'm cleaning up my act, I'm never going to drink again. He goes and gets a suit from the Salvation Army, gets the shirt, he borrows some shoes from his mate, he gets his railway ticket, he gets as far as the Flagstaff Gardens, he goes, oh, fuck it. <laughs> and he doesn't go. You know, so I don't want to have some sort of yeah, you know, Hollywood ending for these people because it would do injustice to the real life characters you're working on. Mm. I, I was sort of Adrian, wondering Adrian, how, yeah. how you sort of negotiate the truth between the balance between the fiction and the reality of the oh. real humans you're writing about. Yeah, when I have the same trouble, I wonder what to do and how to. Look, I don't want to hog well. this discussion. My only point was, you know, Sorry, yeah. you just know, so that if I'm writing, I write a lot of stuff. I write a lot of yeah, you know, political essays, art catalogues. Mm. I know when I. Yeah, the first person to know that they've moved from representation to misrepresentation is the writer. Mm. And some writers go, well, I don't care. Um, I care a lot. And again, I don't say that in a noble way. It's to be, I think you've got to be true to the characters. And when you write these old guys and you think, oh, yeah, he'd get off the piss and he would stay off the piss and he would do it, you think, no, he's not. He's going to go back down with his mates and have a sing song. Mm. So how did you go about it with the choices that you decided to make? Uh, how did I? Uh, with your sorry, with your with your your books with the yeah, the, the I, I just found character. characters basically jumping out at me, yeah. and they tended to be based on they tended to have a, a fragment of someone I'd known at some stage, but then various characters would merge and grow and change, and all sorts of things would happen to them. But again, I just hoped that under that. I remember, I, saw, I remember a quote from Chekhov, something once, there's like a, he saw literature as like a circus of lies on a bedrock of artistic truth. And I hope that somewhere that in there is, that, is the truth of what that, those people I was writing about. Um, Adrian, Sorry. we were talking last night and you said something that was quite interesting to me, that the people that you knew um, uh, from uh, Central Australia had absolutely no problem with the idea of you writing an Aboriginal female character. The ones, I, the few that I, I mean, most of the people that I was working with were very, you know, I'm not surprised traditional by people that. Just, who, who, in whose world books didn't loom very large. I suppose just some of the younger people I'd talked with and had read them, you know, just didn't really have a problem with them. Uh, so, and that, but the basic reaction I got was people just thought they were funny. Mm. <laughs> so, I'd stolen some of their best jokes. Jared, yeah, sorry. sorry. Can I just talk on that? So that issue of writing an Aboriginal female character. I'm writing a new book at the the moment called Songs That Sound Like Blood, and it's basically about a, a young Nukuna girl who wants to be a recording artist. And um, it's about how her dad um, d 
develops her understanding of her culture and politics and her socialisation through discussions about music spanning from the 1950s to present. And so when I met um, Ellie Lovegrove, who's performing tomorrow night, and as soon as we started talking and her mother, I said, I need to let you guys know I'm writing a story about a young Aboriginal woman who wants to be a recording artist. You know, I thought that was ethical, like in terms of them knowing that this is my interest and so therefore let's talk mm. about any of these discussions and... Um, Put them that, in that context. Yeah, because you guys are actually feeding me uh, information that I'm interested that will help to develop the, ca the, the mm. characters. Um, we travelled from the airport today and we talked about that some more because Ellie was talking about a range of her experiences and you know, that they, I will find them um, a payment to be able to read those drafts and to provide feedback. Um, and also, the other thing is that the, the young female uh, character, is, she's gay. And so I need to really be careful about that representation. And that will come from um, engaging with a lot of Aboriginal gay women and um, talking with them about my writing, why I'm why this character is gay and, and my intent, um, for them to make some judgment. The character doesn't need to be gay. It's just that I, I want to talk about that. I think it's important to speak about. Mm. And can I say, Joe, would you have found that most people actually don't mind, you know, most people in fact appreciate the chance you know, to consult like that and feel in some of their stories being told? It, de it depends how it's done. I mean, like mm. <clears throat> a couple of years ago, I was in New Zealand and I was hosted by Linda Tua Smith um, mm -hmm. in, uh, at the University of Waikato and I was sitting in Raglan um, on the front veranda and I was doing some writing and I was writing about, I was writing about um, protocols and basically I was doing an assessment of, or I was talking about all of the protocols written since Lester um, Bostock's um, um, Greater Perspective, etc. And then thinking, well, it's already out there in Terry Janke's work and Pathway and Protocols, etc. And thinking, am I just wasting my time? And then I went and checked my email and there was a non-Indigenous writer who um, contacted me because I, th she was writing about um, Nukuna country, but she was writing about Aboriginal people in our country, but they weren't Nukuna people. And they had their own language and they had different customs and culture and, and, I, and then I went, you know, it is really important what I'm trying to do here because I was, say, I was writing about, well, how do I negotiate protocols from writing from the inside? Mm -hmm. So some people, I was offended, right? I said, if you're going to do this, you can't just say, you know, you're in Corn in South Australia and there's these Aboriginal people and they do this stuff. I mean, who are these people? Mm -hmm. they, she might as well be writing a, a book about, you know, the garden gnome in the backyard. Um, yeah, so, I mean, there is a... I think it's how it's done, and you need mm. to. When I've always, when I've written, um, I've gone to my family and I've said, "Look, I'm thinking about writing this story. Mm. Okay. How I do mean, you feel about it?" And and those discussions had already occurred in the case of songs that sound like blood. There was discussion with Aboriginal women, gay women, about this representation, so I could kind of get a sense. Yeah. The um, I mean, just quickly as an aside, it's it's one of the things that most Aboriginal people in public life suffer, and I mean suffer, is that people will write to you for all sorts of permissions mm -hmm. that you, you just can't give. You know, I've had, I had someone write to me, they're going to write a history of the boomerang, <laughs> and could I help them, and, and could I, did, was it appropriate? Mm. Now, if anyone approaches me about, I want to write an Aboriginal character, what do you think? I actually don't, I said, look, I don't... Yeah. Don't involve me. Sort it out yourself. Yeah. And, you know, because the worst thing is, of course, if they do it, whether they do it, and this is not, whether they do it well or poorly, mm. someone says, I don't like the way you've represented black folks. I say, oh, well, I met this bloke at BMW Edge, Tony Birch, he said it was fine. Yeah. Well, the first mm. thing that could happen, when that person runs into you, you're going to cop it, you know, yeah. so you just say, no, look, don't ask me. Mm. But I think Jared raised another point about, again, about what decisions you make, and, and this is, see, again, we're, we're often talking about, you know, the ethics around writing, um, black writing and black characters, which is key, but of course, and it's already come up, as an Aboriginal writer, you're also writing often outside your own culture. So it's, you should have the same sense of responsibility. Now, the most challenging thing I ever did was when I wrote my first book, um, Shadowboxing, 
One of the fictional stories there called um, The Butcher's Wife is a story about a woman who cuts her husband's head off and his arms and legs and deposits him all around the suburb of Fitzroy because she had suffered domestic and violence and rape over many years. Now, that fictional story is based on a real-life story. It's based on a woman who my mother knew quite well, and I used to go to kinder with her kids, and she did that. She cut her husband's head off, his arms and legs, you know, left an arm and leg behind the Builders Hotel <laughs> behind Gertrude Street, caused this sort of moral panic because no one could find the head, and you know, <laughs> people were, the newspaper was saying this was obviously committed by the mafia, you know, or someone, it was hilarious, a, a detective said, the way that this body was sec dissected, it must be a surgeon or someone with anatomical training. It was a housewife <laughs> with a razor blade in the bathtub, as it turned out. Now, I dealt with that story really ethically because the key to that story in real life and fiction was why was it, one, that a man would assault a woman in a suburb where men were trained and boys were trained to be tough and strong? So my father brought me up to fight in the street, never pick on someone smaller, never b take a backward step, yeah, all that bravado. When you saw a grown man hit a very, yeah, a small and slight woman in the street, why did he do it? Why did no one intervene? Why would no one talk about it when they saw it? And when she was acquitted of killing him, why did my grandmother and mother jump up and down in the kitchen and go, yes, yes, she did it, she got away with it. <laughs> you know, I, I wrote that as a fiction, I agonised over, would I represent this real life story? I went back and did all the research of the newspapers. I published a story, I love the story. Last year I was at the Adelaide Writers Festival, seven years after the book came out, and I was asked to talk about that story again with Richard Aidey. When I got back to Melbourne, I got an email from a woman in country Victoria who was the daughter of the woman who I was a kinder with and said, I'm the daughter of so-and-so, and she told a little story that her mother never told them what had happened to their adults. And I just felt a sh like shock of shame. Not that I could have found the woman, but suddenly a real... And I wrote to her and made all these apologetic remarks and she wrote back and she said, now look, I read the book five years ago. I heard you talk on the radio and she did say, look, what you did actually conveys what my mother felt and I was happy and satisfied. The point being, if she'd been dissatisfied and angry, I would still have to defend having written the story rather than say, I'm sorry and I should never have done it. Mm. Which was, I, I reckon, mm. part of me was tempted in the first instance to try and back off. And you can't do that. If you make the decision to write any material like this, you can't back away from it. So therefore, I hope that that um, informs the levels of responsibility that you should have in the first instance when you're conceiving the story. Mm -hmm. Ellen, can you talk about that, that level of responsibility? It seems to me that there, there is a unique responsibility on, uh, on Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander writers when they're representing their own culture. But can you talk about your sense of responsibility when you sit down to write, write characters? Uh, firstly, I'd like to, to note that we're, we're all fiction writers here. We, we work in fiction, and, and that's a, a choice as well. I think perhaps non-fiction, uh, the, the ethics and, and the rules uh, might be a, a little bit easier to define, a little bit clearer, uh, because you might, be work, you might be writing about a particular community, particular, so there's particular people in a particular place, and and perhaps particular cultural protocol attached to that. Uh, but in fiction, um, I, think, I think we choose fiction because uh, you, you mentioned Larissa Barrent uh, earlier and she, uh, she says that, that fiction builds empathy. Uh, sometimes uh, a f a fiction is, is more powerful than real life events, statistics, uh, what you see on the news, um, and I think uh, that, that fiction also travels really well overseas. Um, and, and it gives... Uh, other art forms do do this really well, but I think fiction has over these, <laughs> these art forms uh, the ability to... that people can sit in, in somebody else's shoes for a little mm. while. Uh, if, if an Aboriginal author is writing with an Aboriginal way of thinking, uh, a reader can connect with that, um, and it, it might it might confront them. Uh, but there's also that that sense of intimacy mm. there, um, and I think that 
that that sort of writing um, is, is always going to be p more powerful than anything else. Something that mm. um, Melissa Lukashenko does with well, kind of effortlessly, I think, um, you inhabit these characters and they've got a way of seeing the world and a way of talking, a way of looking at the world. It's so interesting to me how she devised those characters. But Jared, why did, why did you choose fiction? I mean, you could have worked in very many other forms of writing. Oh, look, it was just luck. I just, I just started writing theatre, and it was because I'd seen um, Roger Bennett's Funerals and Circuses at the Adelaide Festival when I was 16 or so. And, um, and I went, wow, that's incredible. It was the first time I've seen Aboriginal, non-Aboriginal people cooperating on stage, talking about racism in a small country town, and, and I thought, wow, you know, like, because I felt um, really angry about what was happening in my own community. Um, we've got a notorious racist mayor, Joy Baluk, um, and we, we were, you know, moving towards a curfew. Um, uh, so when I seen that, I thought, yeah, that's a vehicle for what I want to do. So I went into writing theatre. Um, and then I guess, yeah, I'm, I'm, I moved towards fiction because of the, the ability to, to move people and develop empathy, like um, Alan was talking about. Um, yeah, so, so fiction, uh, yeah, plus I love writing it. It's, it's a meditation for me and it, and it able, enables me to write about issues within my community and my world without being too personal, I guess. Mm. Yeah. Can I ask, mm. Jack, why uh, you really struck a, a chord with me when you're talking about how you're going to deal with issues of climate change and the impact on your community and which may, of course, cause, well, it seems at least friction between generations. Because in um, um, Alexis Wright's book, The Swan Book, you know, there's an aspect of that which is clearly dealing with the, these fundamentals that we're all facing. It seems to me that that is such an important role because yes. even though you talk about you know, the difficulty of it, I would assume if, if anyone's going to persuade the older generation about change, that, or necessary change, it's got to come from within the community, <coughs> wouldn't it? My, my older generation don't need to change because mm. they're going to pass away before the effects of it are really mm. are felt more. Mm. Um, well, when I started writing Calypso Summer, well, the first, the first sentence reads, it was 39 degrees, my boss hadn't paid me, and I was too, too broke to fix my piece of shit 10 speed. Right now, originally it was it was 33 degrees, and my partner Ruth said, "Nah, put it up a few notches. It's 39, right now." 40. So now we're so now in Adelaide. If it's under 40, it's kind of it's it's Let okay. It, yeah, yeah. And so we're kind of getting more regular days that are 43, mm. 40, 45, consistently hot, etc. So, you know, my it's going to be Aboriginal people that that really um, feel the impact of of climate change first. In remote communities where heat's, are, heat's rising, mm -hmm. people don't have the money, people don't have air conditioning, um, access to water, etc. That's where it's going to be felt. Um, but for my children, mm -hmm. um, my two daughters, um, Tilly and Delilah, my many numerous cousins, they're going to have to think about what can we do on, on Nukana mm -hmm. country to, um, to, to maintain country, to maintain culture. Um, spirituality, everything, and, and protocol is really at the heart of that as well, yeah. um, because it's protocol. You know, I'm nearly 40. When I when I go out to places in country, I still ask permission. I still let older relatives know that I'm going to X or I'm going to Y, and when I do, it's a reciprocal thing because I'm showing respect, and then they will share with me some knowledge, and it could be, this is where you get fish. This is the best pl place for crabs at the moment. Go get some Kwandong over here, or something like that, right? Or just be careful about X, Y, and Z. So that kind of asking, um, that, that permission, that protocol enables you to have a broader knowledge about how to protect country. So with you know, climate change, it is important to me, and, and so I don't really need to persuade my elders who mm. um, are happy to keep running sheep on parts of our country rather than revegetating aspects and things like mm. this. 
Um, mm. It's like those other, the future leaders of Nukuna people. Mm. I suppose what I, what I essentially meant is, and you, then when you talk about the younger generation is, it's in a sense what you're saying is that people within the community have to decide rather than someone riding into town saying this is what you have to mm. do, some outsider. Yeah, and I'm trying to not be so... Um, I'm not trying to hit them with a s mm. sledgehammer with it too. It's very subtle, you know. Yeah. It's like, yeah, it's not. Too, I'm trying not to be too didactic mm -hmm. in the writing. I just want to go through the panel and ask them. I think it's so important to talk about. You know, we talk about literary culture. We're talking about people writing and people reading. So it's really important for us to foreground what is happening on this panel. Jared, can you start with? I mean, of, of course, Calypso Summer published later this year. But what are you working on? into the future. Yeah, so I am working on the, um, on the novel songs set that sound like blood, which is pretty much, it's a story for my daughters and my oldest daughter Tilly, who wants to be a famous recording artist. Um, I don't think she's gay, but she may well be, and, and my daughter Delilah may well be too. And, you know, in case something happens to me, I want them to know that's okay. Mm. Um, so that's kind of why I'm writing that book. Um, and I'm, Wesley Enoch and I are talking about a, a, a theatre work which with um, Brian Butler. So Brian Butler has been a champion of the lateral violence campaign. So we're talking about um, community theatre with lateral violence and also another, another novel which looks at that theme as well. Mm. So it's songs that sound like blood. Yep. Mm. Adrian, what's, what's um, um, happening yeah, for you? My last book was not a novel, it was a non-fiction book about Black Saturday, rather appropriately today. Yeah. And um, I examined it. I, he was, oh, right. I did it as oh. for my PhD and right. Tony was my examiner, thank God he passed me. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much. Um, but I, I sort of, you know, non-fiction can only go to a, a certain extent. I, 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 I think, I think fiction's what really reaches down into the heart. So I suppose I'm trying to write a novel about bushfires and climate change at present. And I suppose the thing that st struck me coming here was the thing that, one of the things that mostly from the sort of study and the writing I did about Black Saturday was just to reinforce how much that knowledge of indigenous concepts of country and so on was important and how our, cult our current society is putting up you know, walls of plastic and steel to isolate themselves from that community, from that environment, sorry. Well, congratulations on the PhD. Uh, Ellen, what's, um, of course, Heat and Light? Yes, uh, Heat and Light will be out in September this year. Um, I also work as, as a part of a project called Black and Right, um, which aims to support and promote black writers, but also black editors as well. Uh, and, and we have a new collection of digital writing coming out next month and Tony and Jared are both contributing, contributors to that, so. Yeah. Alan also um, edited Calypso Summer as well. We yeah. didn't get to get into that, but... Yeah. Yeah. It's a tight little group, this one, everyone knows everyone. So Alan actually edited my piece for Black and Right. Really? Oh. But tell people where they can find out more about Black and Right. Is it, it's, is, is it, is it present online somewhere? Uh, the State Library of Queensland website is a good okay. start. Tony. Well, I've got the new book, um, The Promise, coming out in April for QUP, which is a new collection of short stories. But the big project is the Ghost River Project, um, which, if anyone knows my short fiction collections, they've all got a Yarra River story in them. And this is a story set on the Yarra River in 1971, and it's about, um, it's about two boys, two teenage boys, who meet these guys called the River Boys who texts the, uh, the leader, and a lot of the books about their association with these old guys. But basically, the, the, the idea behind the book, and I know you've heard me speak about this before, and I, I don't want to, I'll do it as brief as I can. There is a, a the story of the Yarra River, is, as Wurundjeri know it, is there, in fact, the Yarra River as it ends now at the, um, the opening of the bay is actually a very recent phenomenon. So the Yarra River used to, the mouth of the, the river used to be what we know as Port Phillip Heads and that changed about 10,000 years ago. And when Europeans first came to Melbourne and Blackfellas told Whitefellas this story, they, they dismissed it as an Aboriginal folk tale and a myth. And it's since both scientifically and clearly, obviously, within Wurundjeri culture, known to be you know, scientifically 
the fact. Proven. Mm. Um, these two divers actually went down and found the original um, bed of the river. But the point is that Tex, the old guy, tells these two boys if they believe in the ghost river, it will save them, and if they don't believe in it, it will take them down, and he says it'll fucking kill you. So it's about whether these boys have enough courage to believe that this old man's story, the Yarra, is the story to follow, and if they don't follow his version of the Yarra, what will happen to them. So, of course, it's going to end in the biblical flood and all sorts of things. So I've written the front half, but it's really to say to readers... This old man who you just think's a no-hoper, mm. he knows. Mm. And if you think he doesn't know, you're, you're a fool. And for me, that epitomises, if anyone knows my work as a body of work, all my characters are on the margins, and they're the people I'm interested in. I got a, a bit of a, a rap on books and writing last year when um, Christos Cholkos was being interviewed about Barracuda. Him and Michael Cathcart said, oh, Tony Birch is the best writer of class in Australia. But I'm actually not, because I don't go outside the marginal. I'm not interested in the interaction between the marginal and middle class. I can't write a... Yeah, I talk about trying to write Blackfellas. I couldn't write a middle class character to save myself. Um, so it's about how we often see people on the periphery and we don't, we don't look at them. And if we miss it, we're going to miss a lot. So <clears throat> I hope that's what happens. I was going to say that a lot of your characters, for me, this question of being Aboriginal never comes up. Like, identity is quite submerged. These are people who are in um, survival mode. Mm. They, they, well, don't, they don't sit around and kind of whinge and complain about not, or the, not knowing themselves. What I, what I like about if you get a group of homeless men, their comradeship is what holds them together, not their, their differences. Now, I, Tex is a black fella, but the other fellas, you know, there's these other fellas, tall boy, cold can, and the doctor. I don't know what their ethnicity is. <laughs> I, and I don't think it matters. Yeah. And if I were to give them ethnicities or those sorts of identities, that it would be an unnecessary intervention. Um, essentially, he matters that he is a black fellow because the knowledge is yes. going to be very important. But um, I think that what can happen, and it's not talking about what, what people here on the panel have been writing, is that you can get in... Like, if you say, a really important point Jared made about a young gay... Um, Character. ...Aboriginal woman who wants yeah. to be a singer. I mean, you know, if that came to me as a, an important device to, to build volume on a character, you would pursue it. But if you did it artificially, you're going to end up with something very shallow. So I try and avoid that. Can you please thank our panel? <laughs> we have just five minutes to take um, some questions from, from you, the audience. Hi. Uh, question about place. Uh, I think uh, if you're writing a non indigenous non-Indigenous, sorry, um, piece of fiction, you can uh, quite easily slot it in an, an, an anonymous large Australian city. Uh, I wonder, uh, in Indigenous uh, terms, is country so important that you can't... I, I note Adrian's kind of got a, an amalgam uh, community. Uh, I'm just wondering, does that work or does there need to be a, a real uh, kind of sense of country? What do you think, Ellen? I mean, is, I mean, you're obviously writing in the urban context. A lot of your characters are in an urban environment, but the, the sense of country is also important to, 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 to your characters. Yeah, I'm thinking of... Um, when you were, when you were uh, speaking, I was thinking of... Uh, something that um, Nunga poet Ali Kobi Ekerman told me and, and she said there's a real difference the, the writing from the desert uh, the, the, than the writing from up north. Uh, she was talking about Marie Mankara's work on the top end uh, by the sea and she can just feel that in, in the language and I think I, I see that as well and uh, but when I, I I've written a lot of, of, of of fiction where the place isn't named and I do that to to make the work move smoother and I feel that um, that for me my authenticity is that I, I do know the place well uh, but I don't need to name it. 
Um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about, um, you know, we talked, uh, even though you're writers of fiction and you talk a lot about truth and representation, I mean, I know as a playwright, I always like to imagine um, possible realities or to actually push the truth, you know, like what would happen if, you know, you're in a court case and someone starts spouting Aboriginal language or, or someone broke into the Melbourne Museum and broke all... It got, took all the artef artefacts and took them back to country. You know, like I'm interested in that. If there's ways that you guys work, like because I enjoy that as a writer, but if there's ways that you work to actually stretch the truth or imagine um, a, another possible reality. When I, um, I mean, I, I used to work in Melbourne, Melbourne Museum. It's actually hard to break into, <laughs> <laughs> and it's interesting. Um, because the thing that would be happening if I was just that you put that sort of scenario, I think, am I going to break into the museum? And I think, no, I won't do that. We'll, we'll, have, we'll make it at some keeping place that has a dodgy lock on the front door. So um, it is interesting about st stretching the truth. When I wrote Blood, I had this um, Aboriginal character, Magic, who has one scene in it, but it's mm. the best scene and sense of enjoyment that I've ever written. Mm. And what I wanted to do with him was I wanted to end up in a situation where he is performative and plays in a way the sort of docile black fella, the sort of house black fella, but in the way I had to end up with a scenario where the reader knew that that wasn't the case, the boy that he was engaging with knew that that wasn't the case, but no one else knew. So the rest of the people in the scene just thought he was magic, the docile black fella. That's why I gave him that name, magic. You know, you, if a black fella plays good football, what do you call him, magic? You know, they, they, it's so generic. I had to stretch a lot of things in a way that would make it believable. So in a way, stretching the truth to make the truth here, yeah, I did that with that scene. I think it's, the difficulty is that you, you, you are, while you're preempting a reader, you can never be confident, well, you can't be fully confident that you can pull it off. So, um, Andrea, the, the, my response would be, it is the thing that you come up with with a writer. If I'm going to play with that to, and really sort of, stretch it, it requires a lot of, for me, a lot of technical nows. Because if I don't pull it off technically, it's not going to work. Question up the back. Um, thank you to all the speakers. Uh, really enjoyable uh, panel. Um, I guess my question is about, uh, and it was sort of touched upon, but why each of you write? Is it because of the ugliness of the social and health challenges? Uh, is it because of the imperative fleeting nature of Indigenous affairs? Um, or is it because you just find it beautiful? Um, <laughs> for the money. <laughs> That's a joke. No money for the money. <laughs> yeah, I guess I write because I don't want the injustice of the past repeated or continued. As simple as that. So I write about, you know, those injustices that happened in the past continue to happen in ways um, hopefully if readers can see them, we avoid them. Yeah, and I second that. Plus, for me, important is just the magic of language, which is just, you know, and writing has enthralled me. I get as much, I mean, I get a lot of satisfaction just writing a good sentence and that sort of never ceases to enthrall me. A good sentence. <laughs> Ellen? It is beautiful and, and my writing is beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> this is a joke. Um, I, I guess I, I write to see uh, people like me on the, on the page, I guess. I, and I, I hope that I, if I imagine the ideal reader, I'm, I'm writing to, to someone a bit like me. And bef before I say why I write, I just want to say something about what Alan's just said to what we started on, it's what, you know, when I said at the start, we need to have as many Aboriginal writers in the public domain, it's that very point. When Alan's book comes out, I've got four daughters. And when I give them that book, and they, I say, this, this writer's a black fella, they'll look at the book and they go, well, that gives, now I can write. Now, if it was a white fella writing the same book, it doesn't mean the book wouldn't work. But it doesn't give them the confidence, that, you know, whether she did it voluntarily or not, Ellen is going to be, she'll become a mentor for a lot of young Aboriginal women. And that's why, that's the great knock-on effect of being a writer. 
I'll fall back on what my mother says. She tells everyone, my son's a writer because he's a mad bullshit artist. <laughs> <laughs> Did she really say that? Yes. Yeah. I don't know what to say. Um, can you please thank our panel?